Welcome to Noon Hour Slides from the Moose Jaw Museum and Art Gallery. We're located on Treaty 4 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot, Cree, Ojibwe, Soto, Dakota, Nakota, Lakota, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We pay our respects to First Nations and Métis ancestors and reaffirm our relationship with one another. We gratefully acknowledge funding from the City of Moose Jaw, Sask Arts, Sask Culture, Saskatchewan Lotteries, Canada Council for the Arts, Canadian Heritage, and the Government of Canada. I'm Vincent Hotelling, the Administrative Assistant here, and I'm here to welcome you to today's presentation. Dave Wentworth is here to talk about a food tour of Northern Spain. Welcome. So yeah, um, that's exactly where we're headed today. Um, uh, we um, are gonna go to Northern Spain, which is different because a lot of times people will focus down on the South. So we'll look at a different part of Spain today and from the lens of a food tour. Um, so a bit about myself. Um, my name is Dave Wentworth and I've been to 37 countries and I love food. I almost like I think I do it every day I think I engage with food every single day I'm sure most of you do as well and I like to eat good food I like to try new things and in 2016 I went on a small group tour um, that lasted for 10 days and it was food themed across northern Spain and um, today I'm going to take you on that journey and show you some of the delicious food we had in Spain, show you um, the towns and the regions that we traveled in. And of course, if you ever maybe wonder, well, what is a food tour like? Like, what's it like to spend a day on a food tour? Um, I'll talk to you about the activities we did and the ebb and flow of that. Um, but yeah, so the tour that I did, the Real Food Tour, and to give credit to that name, Real Food Tour, uh, that's operated by Intrepid Travel. They've been doing small group tours for many, many years. And they launched the food tours, I think it was around 2014. And there was uh, maybe six countries that they were doing, and now there's 25 countries. So it's definitely really popular. I had wanted to do one as soon as I heard about them because I love watching travel shows with like Anthony Bourdain and, and his adventures with food. And so that had me curious to live that sort of an experience myself. And so, yeah, so I had a chance to go on this um, tour um, of Spain. And so we started in northeastern Spain in Barcelona. Um, and from there, we went in a westward direction um, right across to Santiago de Compostela. So this map gives you a bit of an overview of um, where we'll be going today and exactly how I did it. So that first sector was on train and then we used uh, motorized transportation to finish the rest. Um, this small group has a maximum of 12 people and I will have pictures of our group and you'll see it's a real small size so you can get around the table if you're having a sampling. Um, uh, it works really well for food tours, uh, for cooking classes, people can be in the kitchen and close and it's not like you're competing for space because there's 50 people in the cooking class. So, um, so I really recommend it that. And um, if you're curious about what a tour like this goes for, uh, this is a 10 day trip. Depending on the departure, um, it's between 4,000 and 4,200 per person. And uh, there's 12 departures a, a year and those run from May to October. So every couple of weeks they have a departure. Um, and I, this was the, probably the most expensive tour I've ever done in my, um, in my travel history. But I found it was thoroughly worth it because the amount of food that, that was included, rarely was I paying for food. Um, and I was taken to, of course, the best spots to eat and the most unique food experiences. So let's get on with that and take a look at the presentation. So we will start off in Barcelona. And uh, Barcelona, it is Spain's second largest city after Madrid. And it's unmistakably Spanish, but it's downright Catalan as well. It's a very fused city with two cultures and I think it's a city unlike any other. Um, definitely one of my favorite European cities, probably one of my top world cities. And I'm not the only one that feels that way. Barcelona gets a lot of visitors. It's one of Europe's most visited cities. 
and it's a major gateway for flights and also a lot of cruises happen in and out of Barcelona. So many ways that people can get there. So, yeah, so I loved the architecture in Barcelona. I love the mosaic tiling and the flamboyant, playful way that buildings were built. And it just had happened that I was in Eastern Europe before I went on this food tour. So I went from very stark, bland Soviet architecture to this colorful, full of life. And, and this was my first time in Spain as well. And so it really just kind of um, spoke to me. It really resonated with me. And you can see, look how happy I am in my picture here. I'm just feeling the sunshine of summer. I was there, by the way, um, it was the uh, first part of August when I did this. So the pictures you'll see today uh, are from the first part of August. And if I had to do it all over again, I might have went on a departure in September, October, because it would have been really great to be hitting the harvest and be on a food tour. But I, I, I won't uh, complain. Um, so yeah, this is at Mont Jouic, which is a famous hill area, and you can walk up it, or you can take a tram, or go one way and go the other, and great view over the harbour of Barcelona and the city as a whole. You can get a nice overview of how architecturally magnificent Barcelona is in its layout. And one of the neat buildings in Barcelona, a really cool site to check out, is La Sagrada Familia. And so that's a UNESCO site since uh, 1984. And what's cool about that is that it's been under a state of construction since, uh, since the beginning, since 1882. And so it's never quite been completed and yet it's perhaps one of the most visited churches. And there you can see the top of my selfie picture. They have the cranes up there. Um, and each one of those, there's 18 towers up on the to top of the uh, Sagrada Familia, and it's also where the tomb of Gaudi um, can be found. So these were some things I was doing on day one because the food tour didn't start until 6 p.m. And so we were in Barcelona early, just walking around some of the main um, streets. Um, but basically day one of a food tour um, is that you do have a group meeting around 6 p.m. Um, and again, just throughout that day, just you saw some pictures walking around some of Barcelona's sites. I always try to kind of keep going that, uh, in Europe, uh, you know, and I was there with a friend who had just flown in. So he had his jet lag and I was like, no, no, keep going. Don't fall asleep. You'll be up all night. And of course, well, maybe in Spain that would work because there are very nocturnal people, but in any case, we just kept going and we did Las Ramblas, which is this really cool pedestrianized street in Barcelona, and it's lined with lots of cafes and shops and a beautiful tree, um, uh, line of trees runs down the middle of it. And uh, yeah, so once all that was done and we met our group at six uh, in the lobby of the hotel, we went on a cava and tapas tour. And I'll talk more about tapas in the slides. Um, but the next day, we started off um, with a morning food walk in Barcelona. And we're starting off with Cava. And I'm here with my friend who we always love to travel together. And uh, yeah, this was, um, we were both inspired by the same reasons, you know, Anthony Bourdain and um, having our own authentic food experiences. So um, what does a food walk in Barcelona mean? Well, um, it's Spain, so we didn't start off too early. I can tell you that it was probably around 10, 1030 before the day began. And we were okay with that because of course, as a group, we were getting to know each other the night before. Um, and so yeah, around 1030, we uh, went out with our guide and we went to uh, one of the famous markets of Barcelona called Santa Catarina. And so at the Santa Catarina market, we started off um, with cava, which is a sparkling wine produced in Spain. Um, it's one of those European um, origin names. So only um, the cava produced in the cava area of Spain can be called cava by name. You cannot have it, any importations. You can't call it a champagne, it's cava. And it specifically comes from that area of northeastern Spain um, where Barcelona is found. That larger region would be called Catalonia. 
And uh, yeah, so anyway, we started our day off with champagne and then we went walking around the food market. So we went uh, to two markets, of course, Santa Catarina, um, and that's been um, a market since the 1840s. But then we also went to La Bocaria and uh, La Bocaria is the oldest market in Barcelona and that actually goes back to 1217. Um, and I was double checking my notes uh, to just confirm because that's quite old, of course, 1217. And it was um, just neat at the time. And it was where different butchers would gather. And of course now it's expanded and you can get all sorts of foods and oils and meats and cheeses and flowers and fish and everything that you would find in the Spanish market, including horse um, here in, um, in the Santa Catarina market. And more meat. Um, I have been doing a vegetarian lifestyle for the last couple of years, but when I was in Spain, I was not. And I don't know if this would be the most vegetarian friendly destination, as you'll see during our food tour of northern Spain. Um, more cured meats here, so just meats of all varieties, um, and of course a lot of businesses that are your small businesses, that are family businesses, where there's a heritage going back over generations in the specialty, whether it's meat or fish or green grocer. Um, this area had dehydrated goods and spices, and so you can see um, dried chilies and even black truffles. And those are 120 euro a kilo. So um, if you're looking for, that's 2016 prices. And then one of the cool things we did um, was we actually hooked up with a food writer, a food freelancer who um, guided us through the market. So our guide met us at the hotel, he brought us there. Um, but because um, there was a person with this higher level of knowledge, on this food tour, they will incorporate the that more seasoned um, guiding. And so she took the reins and just walked us through this market. And what was so cool was that, you know, we were seeing the food, we could smell things, we could taste things. So it was all the active senses, but it was also educational. We were learning about why markets exist and how a market grows in a European city and how they go back and how they've evolved over the years and why certain things are here and different traditions. And I mean, there's just so much, um, you know, to absorb. There's so much information. And so we went on an olive oil degustation, which um, of course you can do here in Moose Jaw down at Lions Creek. But when in Barcelona, you can give it a whirl at the markets. And I had never participated in an olive oil degustation moment until this time. And it was really cool because I enjoyed um, learning an appreciation for oils that were a bit heavier in flavor, lighter in flavors, oils that you would use for a salad, oils you would use for um, cooking meats. Um, so it really expanded my understanding of olive oil and of course there's the olives as well lots of olives in the market um, and even more olives and also packed in oil or cured fish um, so there's some tuna here and of course I, I'm, I'm not talking your 99 cent can of sandwich tuna this is beautiful uh, white tuna, so a really premium tuna that's been cured in oil. Um, and then the one on the left is oil with paprika. That's why it has that reddish color in there. So different ways that the tuna can be flavored and cured. And of course, we're sampling all of these things. I can't take a picture while I'm eating. So you have to imagine being there and looking at this and then, um, you know, popping some of this into your mouth. And lots of fr fruits as well, um, just to point out that it's not just meats. Um, but again, we are here enjoying a moment with everyday people in Barcelona. So these are the people of Barcelona who are coming down and um, shopping. And we needed to stop at the fruit stand because we were buying groceries with our host as well, our specialized guide who was shopping for ingredients because we were heading back to her place in Barcelona to have a cooking atelier, a cooking workshop, in other words. 
And so when I came back from Spain and having undergone a food tour, a lot of people asked me, they said, oh, what was the, what was the best thing that you ate in Spain? What was the best dish? Um, this was right up there for me and it's vegetarian. So I guess it's, it's good for everyone. And it's a fig that's been split and stuffed with goat cheese and roasted with um, some sweet red wine. And there's some fresh thyme on top of that. And the fig just exploded and was so juicy. And I'm a total cheese hound as well. So of course the goat cheese was uh, absolutely delicious. And then a little bit of thyme and the red wine, it was just amazing. Um, this is one dish of about five or six dishes. and. Uh, that we had in this atelier. And, and I would call it an atelier because we weren't doing hands-on um, cooking. This was not a cooking class at, at this time where we were dicing things and stirring the pot and, you know, being active in the kitchen, but rather we were watching her um, because it was in her apartment and uh, European apartments are quite small. So it was a space that worked better for us to observe. Um, but again, a, a, such I felt such a private experience and just a very special moment um, learning um, all these different dishes. And I kid you not, there were 12 bottles of wine um, opened uh, for our group of 12 people to enjoy. So that's a bottle of wine per person, uh, four bottles of white, four bottles of red, and four bottles of sparkling cava. So um, we were, again, really well taken care of. And after eating all of that food and we're going through the market, uh, I was totally stripped for energy and my friend was too. So then we discovered the lovely Spanish tradition of sauntering back to your hotel room around 3.30 and having a nice siesta uh, for a couple of hours, um, letting all that food digest. And then we just had an evening in Spain on, or in Barcelona on our own. The next morning, it was time to uh, shake, rattle and roll. We were leaving Barcelona and we were taking the train to Logroño. And so Logroño is uh, located in the La Rioja province. And so we took the high speed Spanish train that goes from Barcelona to Madrid. It has a stop in a main town that's halfway called Zaragoza. And then in Zaragoza, we transferred and it was a more older style, but still lovely Spanish train that took us into Rioja. And this was our, our only train moment in Spain, but it was a very comfortable way to travel. And it brought us through to Legroño, which is a city of 150,000 um, people. And when we arrived, um, we got in. And one thing with Intrepid Tours that I've always kind of enjoyed, I've, I've actually done 11 of their tours over the years, uh, is that when you get to a new town, um, you go to your hotel and then they'll have like a quick 30 minute orientation walk. So you can go around town and just learn some bearings and find out where anything is. Maybe, I don't know if you need a laundromat or post office or whatever you're looking for. And um, on this orientation walk, we went by an ice cream store and they had blue cheese ice cream. And while I was saying just a few moments, of course, I'm a total cheese hound. I love blue cheese. Um, I was never thought of a blue cheese ice cream. And it was just a whiff of blue cheese um, in, the, in the overall ice cream, but it was just totally amazing. Just a, a flavor I never thought I would have. Um, so yeah, we did our orientation walk. We went back to the hotel. Um, I, I think we had probably siesta time. And then that evening we went out on the town because one thing Lagronio is known for and attracts tourists from all over the place um, are for the bite-sized foods that in Spain, you would often hear them called tapas, but you know, Spain is a multilingual country. And so to respect that multilingual tapestry, there are other names for tapas that you'll find in Spain. Um, so in this area, for example, they call them pinchos. Um, so it kind of makes me think of pinching, pinchos, and literally foods that you could eat with your fingers, bite-sized things. So here we have, uh, I mean, it doesn't sound overly fancy, but we have like a chicken wing with ketchup. Um, we have 
uh, croquetas, which are my favorite. I have a picture of those here. Um, croquetas are like a potato cake. Sometimes they would have like um, ham and cheese or asparagus and parmesan, uh, different fillings mixed in with the potatoes. And then they're pressed into these um, patties and coated with breadcrumbs and fried. Um, so it's just a hot potato bite with like so much loaded infused flavor. Um, and so on one of these um, um, experiences, like you're kind of floating around from one little bar to the next, and it's not a dance bar, it's a spot in, where people are grabbing a cocktail or a drink, a glass of wine, a cold beer, whatever, and they're having some of these finger foods. And, and most often um, they would have little toothpicks and you would just save the toothpicks and they would be able to count up how many toothpicks. And so if it was one euro per appetizer, um, you would just count, oh, you had six appetizers, uh, six euros and then your drink and they would cash you out afterwards. So it was just a real easy way to kind of grab and go and just keep track of what you were eating and try lots of different things. And of course, every bar has its speciality. Uh, this was one that I took a really up close picture of, but it was of the uh, Padron peppers, which I fell in love with. And I believe there's a fish underneath of that. And it's just on a little piece of baguette. But um, yeah, like overall, it just like kind of fit in my hand. It might've been two bites here. And again, this is a pinchos in, uh, in this area of Spain. And so if you're ever in Logroño, um, you'd want to head to, well, streets are called Calle in Spanish. So Calle Laurel and Calle San Juan. Um, they are known for having such a high density of these restaurants and these bars. And again, people from all over Spain, all over Europe, all over the world um, come there. And there's an example of the crowd that uh, has gathered the night we were there. And I mean, I wasn't keeping an eye on the clock, but I mean, this went late. This is Spain. Things went late. Things started late. Nobody's watching the top, uh, the clock. It's just about enjoyment of the moment and, you know, absolute pleasure. Uh, the next morning, however, we did have to get up. So no matter what time it was that I drug myself back to the hotel room with Jamie, we had to get up because we were on the roll again. And um, so the tour operator had arranged a bus to pick us up, to pick our group up. We drove about two hours into the La Rioja um, province of Spain. And if you are a wine drinker, you might recognize the name La Rioja. Um, it's a famous wine from this part of Spain. And here's a bodega, which is a, another way to describe a winery. Um, and so we did a wine degustation at a bodega in um, a small town called LaGuardia. If you want to Google it, LaGuardia, uh, Spain in the La Rioja area. And here it's interesting as well, because we are starting to move away from the Catalan speaking area of Spain and moving more towards the Basque area, which is culturally and linguistically speaking an entirely different culture uh, that can be found in Spain and parts of France. And so here's our group um, and we are underground, we are in the cave and uh, the lady who's standing next to the, the barrel, she's the hostess for this bodega who has brought us down and this is a, a full tour, uh, Latin English, again, private for our group. Um, I don't know how much we sampled, but um, nobody was driving the vehicle. They had a bus for us, so it was all good. That's one of the perks of being on a food tour. Um, yeah, and we, um, of course, were sampling the La Rioja wines that are produced here. And that Rioja wine as well is another one of those European controlled names that uh, it has to be from this region. And the weather's improved as well come after our, um, our, our morning degustation. I think we started that at like 10, 30, 11 o'clock. That was one of our earlier days in Spain. Um, uh, someone tells me we left Lagronio at nine and got there at 11. So we were probably in that bodega for a couple of hours, um, having our sample, learning about wine. And um, yeah, the bus waited for us and we piled back in and we drove two more hours that day to wind up in San Sebastian. That's our group, by the way, and, and the guy in the middle with the black shirt. So he is our local guide. So again, the way it works on this is that he's the 
person who's there to guide from Barcelona all the way to Santiago de Compostela. Um, and again, just organize the logistics. And when we have local guides who pop up, just, you know, tuning in with them, making sure that they're um, there and they're ready. And so a logistics master. And our group, by the way, had, uh, well, myself and my friend, we were the only Canadians, quite a few from Australia, a mother daughter from the United Kingdom. Um, and so in my experience with these tours, a lot of people from around uh, the Commonwealth countries and USA. And then we grabbed some more bite-sized food, some lunch for the bus ride to San Sebastian. So it's like an omelet sandwich, um, which, I, when I was putting the pictures together, I was like, this doesn't look glamorous, but if you can see in the sandwich in the back on the left, it has that beautiful Spanish Serrano ham, which is uh, food for the gods. That is just delicious, salty, cured, oily ham. We ended up, um, our, our day wound up in San Sebastian in San Sebastian, Spain, um, which it's a mix of Basque, Catalan, and French culture, and Spanish culture, and, you know, it's only 20 clicks from the um, French border, um, and it also has one of Europe's finest beaches, and this is a panorama picture I took of that beach, which is why a lot of Europeans flock there. It's called um, La Concha, and so, yeah, a lot of people are going to go to the beach, but we were there for food. We were there on our food tour, of course. So this was another cooking atelier. And I should have called this really a cooking work workshop. Uh, the lady with the black t-shirt who's standing next to me, she was our local hostess from San Sebastian. And uh, so she was there to walk us through an entire um, lunch. And so we all did different things. I made a goat cheese ice cream. So more cheese and fused ice cream. That needs to be a thing. It is delicious. Um, and yeah, we learned how to sear. I learned how to sear tuna properly. Um, and we learned um, just all sorts of things. Uh, it, it's really hard to describe because there was a lot of information coming out of, I think we had a gazpacho um, making part of it as well, because I remember eating gazpacho and that is, of course, a very famous cold tomato soup um, that's enjoyed across Spain. Um, onwards and upwards, we did leave um, San Sebastian, but just before, um, you know, our group leaves San Sebastian, if you're interested in going there, if you love food, um, you really want to make a note of San Sebastian because, you know, gastronomically speaking, it's it's known for the Basque cuisine that you're going to get there. Um, I remember going to a restaurant I had heard about called La Vigna, and it's known for a dish called burnt Basque cheesecake, which is like a cheesecake crossed with a um, creme brulee. Um, very burnt across, absolutely delicious. Um, but if you're looking as well for something more refined, San Sebastian has the second highest density of Michelin restaurants per capita than any other city in the world. The only other city that's above San Sebastian is Kyoto, Japan. So it's in the lead for Europe. And if you want to have that Michelin experience, there's all sorts of restaurants in San Sebastian to offer you. We went to Picos de Europa next. Picos de Europa is actually a national park area. Um, and one thing that I think um, surprised us um, for Jamie and I is that when we had pictured Spain, we'd always pictured the whitewashed buildings, the windmills, the more umber sunburnt landscape, which I think you get more in Southern Spain, which is where a lot more tourism happens. But in the north, it's quite green. The coastline's very rugged. And going through these mountains was nothing short of comparing it to going through Switzerland. Um, the mountains were high. We were driving up high. They had arranged a, a shuttle bus to take us up there. And um, our ears were popping. And we could hear cows walking by, clanging their bells. And, um, you know, had you told me we were in Switzerland, I would have thought I fell asleep, took a siesta and, and woke up in Switzerland. But of course we were still in Spain um, in this Picos de Europa, meaning the Peaks of Europe National Park. And so there's our group again, popping out for some great scenery. 
and a, another local guide as well who had a specialty in cheese. More on him in a moment. Um, we we arrived in Picos uh, de Europa in the evening, and so we didn't do that much because the day was running out. We checked into this hotel that was, again, it just almost felt very Swiss. It was like Heidi should have been flinging open the shutters and um, and saying welcome. But again, it was, it was Spain. And so we had this beautiful meal that was prepared by the innkeeper. And one dish that I had, this would also be right up there, um, was a um, white bean stew that was in, included chorizo and pork knuckle. And that's called fabada. And I ate like four bowls of that fabada. It was so good. And they had a smorgasbord of other little mountain hilltop specialties. Um, so really well taken care of in this charming little inn way up in the hills of northern Spain, a place I probably never would have ended up if it hadn't been for being on this food tour. And then the next morning, it was market day in this little market town. And um, it was really cool because what they had arranged with the tour was they put us in pairs. And so Jamie and I paired up, we were traveling together. And I can't remember if we were given five euros or 10 euros as a pair, but by the time it was all worked out in the group, there was like six duos and each duo had their budget and were told to pick up something in this category. So it could be meat or bread or cheese or, or whatever your a beverage, whatever your assignment was. And so we all get to explore the market, but we had this additional activity that was leading to a picnic lunch up in the mountains. And of course, what we ended up eating was what we bought fresh in the market that had been just brought in. And I'm talking fresh fruits, fresh charcuteries, fresh um, cheeses, breads, of course, sweets, tomatoes, cucumbers, um, you know, beverages of alcoholic and non-alcoholic variety. Um, and we just enjoyed this beautiful hilltop location. This overlooked a monastery that was in front of some mountains. So it was in back of the monastery, actually just to, I know just looking at this, you might have thought we were just at, at a truck stop in Northern Spain, but it was actually a really special location up in the mountains. And uh, just, again, a really simple moment that was about the total pleasure of that moment in time. And another picture of our spread of this burnt cheesecake making an appearance again. Um, and yeah, peaches were in season as you can see and the watermelon and just, just all sorts of things, beautiful cheeses. Um, and you know, moments of that, I think, you know, that uh, again, if you are concerned about vegetarianism or just not eating too, too much meat, um, there are options in Spain. And then we left that town and we went to the moment I was the most excited for in the tour. Um, there is a blue cheese called Cabrales. Um, I, I don't even think you can get it in Canada or at least not in this jurisdiction. It is totally unpasteurized cow milk cheese. They also do some that will be goat cheese or sheep's or maybe a mix of goat and sheep. And it is a blue cheese. And if you see in this picture, if you really look at it, yes, there is a hairy mold growing on that cheese. And so we descended, we, we drove first to the cheese farm and then this guy met, uh, met us and we walked, I don't know, maybe it was about 100, 200 meters down this mountain path. And it was quite jagged actually. We were really up at a high altitude and there was a door into the side of a mountain, like, a, like an old military hatch. And he twisted it and opened it up. It was like an old vault, the way that he would spin around that wheel and opened up the door. And then we went in and as soon as he opened, um, you know, love it or hate it with blue cheese, that aroma just wafted out. And of course I was drawn to it. And we went down into different caves and the further you would go down, um, depending uh, if this is a good word for you or not, it was a repugnant smell. Again, I was totally in love with it. Um, and I've been to the Roquefort Caves in Spain, or in France, where Roquefort blue cheese comes from. This was a whole nother level. And again, that could be either heaven or hell for you, depending on your take on blue cheese. Uh, my friend Jamie hates blue cheese. So he was in his hell moment. I was in my heaven moment. And then of course, after our tour of the caves, we went back to the shop where they had uh, plated tasting for us. And so uh, moving from the left to the right, uh, the left would be like a lighter cabrales. And then the one in the middle is your full body, full octane 
really hardy. I mean, that plate was probably, that was almost moving across the plate. And then a light Cabrales spread where, you know, it's just a few crumbles in a big fat of a soft, creamy cheese. So just a, just an air of that. And then in the corner, you'll notice a slice of uh, quince base, which is very common in Spain when you're doing cheese tasting and it offers a sweeter um, flavor to balance out against some of the saltier tastes that we're having here. And I believe that's a fruit jelly um, in the white ramekin. Onwards, we go to Oviedo. So the same bus that took us up into the mountains and drove us around all these little places, uh, brought us down to Oviedo where um, it was adios uh, to that driver. And we didn't spend much time in Oviedo. Uh, along the way, we did stop in the town of Bilbao as well, which we had free time in Bilbao. Um, and that was an option where you could go in. There's a Guggenheim Museum that's in Bilbao. So some people are really into that. Uh, Jamie and I ended up doing uh, our own thing for a bit. But yeah, we just had some free time in Spain. So again, we weren't on tour the whole time. You know, we had a balance of doing our own thing. Um, yeah, and we ended up in Oviedo for the night. And, you know, not much here really for us. I guess it was an overnight stop and it was a logistical place to be but they have these delicious padron peppers in Spain. You can see that on this picture and they're served in the basket and they're, they're fried green peppers and you can eat them in Spain like, oh my gosh, like the way we eat potato chips here. Just, you know, you can't just have one. It's just onwards and onwards. And of course they work up a, a really good thirst as well. So no matter what you're looking to drink, they're great bar food for that and, and, to add to the thirst there, normally finished with a really nice crunchy sea salt on that fried pepper goodness. Um, absolutely delicious. And another thing that you'll see all over the place here in all the parts of Spain that have Basque culture um, is they do, they, they have an apple cider there. This is an apple producing part of Spain with the cooler climate. And so they've been doing apples there for centuries and centuries. And there's these, um, uh, a cider, it's called Sagadora, and they pour it out of this beaker with this long stem, and they pour it from really high, and they, if you can see my hand up in the picture, like they're going up and down, and it's splashing all over, it makes just an awful mess, but that mess is part of the culture, it's part of the fiesta, it's in the moment, and people uh, enjoy the cider as well, but they enjoy the tall pour and the bubbles it makes, and they're singing, and there's revelry, and um, you know, I'm originally from the East Coast. It just reminded me of a good kitchen party, but Northern Spain style, Basque style. And of course, I was just eating a ton of those peppers. Our last stops um, are two communities that are side by side. They're, they're cities. Each of them are small cities. Uh, the first is called A Coruña, and then the second would be our stopping spot for this tour, Santiago de Compostela. Um, so here we are in A Coruña. We have made it to the north western point of all of Spain. That's pretty cool. And so two boys from the east coast and we're on segways. Look at that. So I don't know if you've ever taken a segway, but I find them just totally uh, fun. And I'm thinking I should get one for the season here in Moose Jaw. Maybe you'll see me up on Thatcher Drive in a segway. Uh, we did more market touring. Uh, what's unique about this picture and what I wanted to call your attention to was underneath these um, hams, these uh, cured hams, are these little white um, cups. They almost look like um, a hopper bin. And that's collecting the oil that over time slowly, 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 slowly drips out of this. And then that oil is like talk about a liquid gold. Uh, it's flavored so strongly with the ham. It's people go nuts for it. Um, and I, I don't even know what they would sell that for, but I'm sure it's like a premium price product, like a truffle oil. Um, lots of peppers as well. I had this fun picture when I was going through my album. I, I think I love this as well too, just because the bright colors reminded me of the Spanish flag, a fiesta of color. And so much seafood in this corner. So again, if you look at the map of Spain, we are on the part that is um, surrounded largely by water and so of course just like uh, fishing communities in North America there's a tradition linked to the sea and harvesting from the sea. I don't even know what this fish is um, but the only other thing I know of with teeth is a piranha. We had a seafood lunch. Here's a razor clam that's finished in an olive oil 
aioli with, you can see there's a, you know, fine assortment of herbs that has been diced into this. And I had never had this before. Um, I it was totally new for me. I loved them. I thought they were fun. And then after our seafood lunch, which was included, and again, talking about the value on these food tours, you know, we never would see the receipt. Of course, they were always very careful about that. But I did see the menu when we walked in there and I know roughly what we ordered. And I think that seafood lunch was probably 75, 100 euros per person, um, all included. And just any of the Spanish seafood you could ever want and any knowledge you would want to ask, um, the chef could be called out, you could ask questions. Um, it was a total top-notch food experience. And I should point out as well that one stereotype I had about doing a food tour was that it would be a lot of like, you know, wear a jacket and a shirt and it's a sit down white linen experience and knowing which fork to eat and uh, so on and so forth. But it wasn't a haute couture dining where it was not this um, extravagant level. It was everyday food that's part of the history of the destination that everyday people are eating, um, eating, you know, whilst on the go, eating at a park, eating um, at a, a special restaurant that just regular people would go maybe for a fancy dinner, but nothing, um, nothing to the nines. And I really like that. I, I like that genuine organic style. Well, anyway, back to our end point here. So Santiago de Compostela, it's the end point for the Camino. If you've ever heard of the famous uh, St. James Way Camino, which starts um, actually just over by San Sebastian. It starts over at the French border there and goes all across Northern Spain. Well, that's a very famous footpath that has been traversed by pilgrims and for hundreds and hundreds of years. And they walk it to reach the holiest city of Santiago de Compostela. And when um, you walk it, typically it takes about 40 days to reach from France to um, Santiago de Compostela. Some people do shortened sections. I like to kid with people and say, oh yeah, I've done the Camino, but with my taste buds, not with my, not with my feet, because I was on a food tour, of course. So anyway, that's my recommendation. Do the Camino, but on a food tour. But yeah, we got down to um, uh, Santiago, which is one of the holiest cities in Europe. And they have those incense burnings, Botafumeros, which I'd never heard of that before. But if you've seen them, um, they are the huge cauldrons that incense is burned in churches and they swing them through um, the high ceilings of the church. And so all of that incense smoke, you could smell that out on the streets in Santiago. Um, so just a lot of religion on the go. Um, of course, I was there for food and one of the religious sins is gluttony. So I decided that would be my thing. This is like a cronut before cronuts became a thing in North America. So it's like croissant and a donut. So just like layer upon layer of laminated dough fried to perfection. Um, and yeah, I was walking a lot, you know, I needed those calories to keep myself going. And our final evening in Santiago was a final group dinner. And these, this was a really great group to travel with. And so um, to use the phrase, you know, total pleasure, just going out with dinner and um, a beautiful seafood here, uh, a tuna crudo. So lightly, it was raw from crudo meaning raw and potatoes served with um, like a fried potato swirl on the top. And again, finishing just a nice little bit of oil and herbs. And, you know, Santiago doesn't have a ton of flights, so then Jamie and I had like a day's wait there. So we uh, just, uh, our last day, rented a car and we went driving into the countryside. This is a monastery in a town called Samos, Spain. It was quite beautiful. We found that quite beautiful. We'd stopped there, had a lunch. And then we continued driving to the absolute limit, the last place that you can get to in North uh, in northwestern Spain, and that's called Cabo Finistere, and I don't know if we have anybody here who can remember being back in the old Latin class, but Finistere gives us end of the land, right, so Cape of the end of the land, and it's, again, as some East Coast boys, it's pretty cool, because we look across the Atlantic, and we're like, oh, it's just, just like 3,000 kilometers that way, uh, and we did it, we finished our food tour, we crossed Spain, 
So I'll um, uh, break my slide here and just kind of come back to the regular Zoom group here. But uh, just before I do, um, if you want to keep in touch, uh, my name is Dave Wentworth. You, there's a few ways you can find me on the internet through Facebook and Instagram. And uh, yeah, if anybody has any questions or pardon the pun, but food for thought, I'll come back to the main room now and I can hear your questions or thoughts. Oh, there's a question in the chat. Uh, yeah, so that cost is on the ground. The participants for these tours come from all points over the globe. So airfare is done separately. So, and one thing to mention with them is that if you're traveling by yourself, um, they will pair you with a person of the same gender if you don't want to pay a single supplement. So that appeals to some people. And if you are traveling by yourself and you want your own room, you can have that as well. You can pay a little extra for that. Um, but they'll match you with other solo travelers. Is anybody hungry now, by the way? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Me too. I knew that was going to happen when I was putting these slides together last night. I, yeah, gave me nighttime food cravings as well while I was laying out the slides. <laughs> 